Konnichiwa. I'm, hello. That's about the limit of my Japanese, unfortunately. So we'll uh, talk here a bit about DNSSEC and Dane and the case for using them. And uh, so to begin, I want to ask a question of the group here. How many of you have heard of DNSSEC or worked with it? Okay. All right. A good number. About half the group. That's great. Excellent. I'm going to begin then, for those who are not familiar, with a brief overview of what DNSSEC is all about, and then I will also talk a bit more about what Dane is used for. So to begin with, if we look at a normal way that DNS works, just in general, if the web browser down there in the lower, um, well, I guess it's your left, is going to be the user on the computer, as you all are here, where you're at your computer and you're doing things. When you type in an address, such as www.example.jp, your web browser, before it goes to that website, has to go and find out what the IP address is of that website so that it can get there. And so in order to do that, it goes off into, it queries its local DNS resolver and asks, what is the IP address? And the DNS resolver goes and does this pattern that you see here where it goes up to the root server, then it goes to, in this case, the .com server. Ultimately, it gets to a DNS server that can provide an IP address. And so it does that back to the DNS resolver, to the web browser, and then you as the user can then, the web browser will connect to the server and get back the web page. This is how DNS works on the internet. Now, I'm showing the web. This is also how email communications work. This is how instant messaging works. This is how the other, um, the other applications work that our keynote speaker just spoke about, the other services and things. They all begin by using DNS to find out the IP address that they need to communicate with. The challenge that we get into with DNS is that in this sequence, an attacker can send a message back saying, instead of going to this website at this IP address, go to this other IP address. Okay, and it is all about speed. Whoever gets the answer back quickest is the one that the DNS resolver will take. So the DNS resolver sends out its message, says, give me www.example.com, and whatever answer it gets back first, typically, is the one that it sends on. That's how, that's how DNS works at, at a high level on that. And so the web browser gets the wrong information and goes out to the wrong website. When you think about security issues, phishing attacks, impersonating bank sites, for instance, anything like that, this is a, a way that you can have a serious attack. Worse than that, though, when the DNS resolver gets this information from the attacker, it holds on to it in its local cache for some period of time, what's called the time to live, or TTL. It holds on to it for that period of time. So for some time period, the web browsers and others who use this resolver will get the wrong information. This is sometimes called a poisoned cache or a man, this is, you're creating a man in the middle attack type of thing. Now what happens with DNSSEC is that we add some extra information into the, the DNS records so that when the DNS resolver gets back the IP address and the other information, it also gets back these extra records. And you can see them up here on the screen. There's a DS record, a DNS key, an RR SIG. The exact specifications are not something I'm going into today, but there's these extra records. They have some signatures and, and pieces like that. And so what can happen is that when the resolver gets back the information, 
it checks the DNS key, it checks the records, and even if the attacker tries to spoof the records, even if they try to provide other information, the DNS resolver will still uh, realize there's a problem, and it will send back an error. In DNS speak, it's called a serve fail, but essentially it sends back an error. It says that website or that IP address is not available, and it can protect people from that. The examples I showed you were for the web, but DNSSEC protects any information coming out of DNS. And so for email, instant messaging, voice over IP, other protocols, basically anything that communicates across the internet can benefit from this protection that DNSSEC provides. DNSSEC basically says the information that was put into DNS is the same information that you get out. It protects you on that level. I want to give you an example of a current threat that's going on right now. There are some researchers at um, an organization in the United States, at Carnegie Mellon University, who identified that somebody, they don't know who, is hijacking email by using this kind of DNS cache poisoning. They're doing this today, right now. Some email, instead of, because with email, an email server queries DNS for the MX, or mail exchange, the MX record, and it asks, basically, where do I deliver email for this domain? If I'm going to send email, if you're sending email to me at isoc.org, isoc.org, your mail server has to find out what the MX records are to get your message to me. What's happening, these researchers found, is that somebody out there is poisoning some records for some domains so that the email is going to somebody else's mail servers and then it's going, it seems to be being delivered. The messages are getting through. But this team of researchers was unable to figure out who is doing this. They don't know if it is a government doing surveillance. They don't know if it is malicious attackers who are trying to go and you know, read through email. They don't know who's doing it. But this is an example of a current threat that's happening out there and the slides provide some links to where you can learn a bit more about this particular attack. But the point of this is that it could be prevented with DNSSEC if companies sign their records with DNSSEC and if the mail servers check for these signatures. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But this is a very real example of where DNSSEC could ensure that your email is getting to the end without being intercepted by somebody else. Let me talk about the two sides of DNSSEC. There's two parts. One is the signing of your domain name. So that's something you all can do if you have domain names. I should ask, how many of you have signed domain names? Couple, no, all right, a few, okay. So this is something you all can do. I know that the, I know that .jp does accept uh, DS records, et cetera, if you, ha if you have a .jp domain name, and the others do as well. On the signing side, you are putting cryptographic signatures on your DNS records to say these are the records, and, this, and there's a, a process that happens there. And every time you change and update your DNS records, your signatures get updated. And so there's a process there. Now on the other side, and this is also something all of you could do, you can turn on DNSSEC validation so that your local DNS resolver is checking for signatures. So there's the two parts, signing your name and then resolving or validating the names. And those are two different things. You can do one without the other. Turning on validation 
is as simple as adding a couple of lines to a configuration file for most of the, of the DNS resolvers that people use. Often they use one called Bind, Unbound, Microsoft Windows Server. Okay, those are some that they use. It's some, a simple configuration change to start checking signatures. And that's one thing that everybody here can do. The signing side can be a little bit more involved, but oftentimes it is quite simple too. Let me just go on a bit about the, so excuse me, let me back up. <coughs> on, the, on, the valid, on the validation side, typically that DNS resolver is at your internet service provider, or if you're a company, it might be on the edge of your network, so where your firewall is or, or right there. Uh, it might be within the application itself. On the signing side, it involves several different pieces. First of all, you, looking at the bottom of this chart, you is the domain name registrant. You are the person registering a domain name, example.jp, whatever else. You are going to turn on DNSSEC or you're going to do something like that. Now somebody is going to run the name servers that are authoritative, that, that speak, that publicize your DNS information. They're this DNS hosting provider on the slide. They're going to sign the zones. Okay, they're going to do that and publish the records. Now, the registrar is the company that you registered your domain with. You went to their website, you purchased a domain, you did that type of thing. They have a special role that they have to transmit something called a DS record. It's a little part of the signature that helps make all this work they send it up to the top level domain or the TLD that's at the top of all of this. So all of these pieces work together to make the signatures work. Now sometimes the registrar is also the DNS hosting provider. So when you register example.jp, that registrar may also do the DNS hosting for you. It's a very common thing is that you'll go there and so if I went to a registrar and took out danyork.jp or something like that, if I wanted to, they, I might have them handle my DNS for me. Now other people might want to operate their own DNS servers. A company, an enterprise, might choose to operate their own DNS servers and they might wish to do that there. Either way, the pieces are all put together here. I wanna just quickly look at a couple of statistics right now. This shows, this map that I have up here, shows the country code top level domains. Things like .jp, .au in Australia, you know, others in that region, or for a, for a region. Those are shown on this map, and it's showing the current status of these domains around the world. Most all of the top level generic TLDs things such as .com, .org, .net, those are all signed right now. But this shows the status of the country code ones. And in order to use DNSSEC, you really need to have your top level domain signed. And the good news for you in Japan is that you are signed, and I'll show you more on that in a moment. I'll just mention, these maps are published every Monday as part of the project that we do. You're welcome to subscribe if you're interested in these kind of things, you can subscribe to a mailing list and receive these maps when they come out each week. Here's a quick picture of the Asia Pacific region, just showing you again some of the domains in this region, this, the, the top level domains that are signed. As you can see, there's a, the green are the, are the uh, operational or the signed ones at some level. There's also an increasing number of domains being signed this shows you this chart going on as all of these new GTLDs are coming out, the dot bank and dot book and dot wedding and all of these hundreds of new domain names that are now becoming available. They're all coming out signed by default at the beginning. There's also a new chart run by the folks near here in Asia Pacific Network Information Center, APNIC, the APNIC labs team have been tracking validation. How many people are checking signatures? 
And right now they're showing about 12% of overall global DNS queries are being checked for signatures, which is actually a pretty good amount considering where DNSSEC, the growth that we're seeing there. If you go to their website, and the address is here at the bottom, although this is the big long one for this map, but you could just go to stats.labs.apnic.net slash DNSSEC, you can go and see the statistics for a given country. So you can go and see what are the statistics for Japan, for instance. I have a little chart here too that shows some of the deployment for individual domains. The one in the upper left corner up there is for the .gov domain in the United States. And it has, at the current time in there, about 87% of the domains have been signed with DNSSEC at the top, at the level there. These are in the second level down here. Over here on the lower left, you can see Brazil has, uh, in .br, has a significant number, about 639,000 domains that have been signed there. These charts show some of the, the signatures in, the, in some European domains. This is .com and .net, although they're, or .com and .org. They're very small percentages, but they're growing in the right direction. So it's some of what's happening with DNSSEC around the world. I want to move on to talk about Dane, and I do also want to open it up for questions at the end. Dane is a way to add, to use DNSSEC, to add a layer of trust to the typical certificates that we use in things such as web, email, instant messaging, et cetera. If you think about a web interaction, if I'm going and doing online sales or banking, I'll go to a site and I'll get my nice little lock icon in my web browser and it'll say HTTPS whatever and the lock shows me that I've got a secure connection. It's encrypted with what has been traditionally called SSL or secure socket layer, okay? We change that, I talk about it here as TLS, or transport layer security, because that's the real name for it today. But you may think of it as SSL, we talk about it as TLS. But the process that you have is the web browser goes out to DNS, does its thing, connects to the web server, and gets back a web page that's encrypted. The question is, is it encrypted with the correct certificate? It's possible that an attacker could get in the way, could break the connection, could reconnect, do generate another certificate, and wind up showing you that you still have a TLS encrypted connection. You think you are safe. But in reality, what may be happening is that the attacker may have gone and taken the information, stored it in log files or something else. With Dane, what happens is in this environment, there's an extra record added in DNS, something called a TLSA record, a TLSA record. That record contains some information about the certificate, about the TLS certificate. And a web browser that used Dane or any other application could check that and it could see, I'm getting a TLS certificate from the web server. I also have a, a check, a fingerprint coming from DNS, from the Dane record. Do they match? If they match, all is good. If they don't match, it can indicate there's an error or as in the mail example before, it could refuse to deliver email to the MX to the server that was not the correct one. That's what Dane does. Dane is defined in a, in a RFC and it basically asks this question. How do you know the TLS certificate is the correct one? And the answer is to put the certificate or a fingerprint in DNS. Now the certificate could be one from a certificate authority, a traditional TLS certificate that you might purchase. It also can be one that you generate yourself. 
I want to just mention that briefly. Not to go into too much specifics, but this, the specification lets you indicate whether you want to restrict it to just certificates that come from a certain certificate authority, or you can say, I want to specify this exact certificate, or you could say, I want to allow certificates from my certificate authority. If I'm an enterprise, a company, and I want to say this is what I'm doing there. So I can go and do this in a couple of different ways. It's now, Dane is not just for the web. It's, also, it's for using, securing any connection that can use TLS or SSL. As I'll say on the next slide here about su some of the success stories, email is actually one of the biggest places right now that people are using Dane to protect the communication channels. They're using it at a, a very high degree. There's some 360 email servers right now around the world that are using TLSA records as part of this. Um, and that's, again, preventing the type of communication misdirection. Actually, it's going beyond what I talked about before. It's providing a way to do encrypted email communication or transport between web between servers. So you can do an encrypted communication between mail servers. The Jabber community, or XMPP, they also have gone and encrypted their communications using Dane to go and do this. Interestingly, in Germany, a number of web hosting providers are now advertising that you can get the higher level of security through DNSSEC and Dane. So we're seeing some great success out there. So just to kind of come back to a bit about what Dane can do for you here, there's really four main elements of what Dane allows, or how Dane and DNSSEC protect your business. Okay, as I've shown here, part of what you want to do is you want to know that you, the people can trust that the information you publish in DNS is in fact the right information. You want to be sure your customers are reaching your sites, okay? You also want to be sure that you're communicating with your customers, that the email that you're sending is in fact getting to their servers. So you want to do that. Trust is probably the highest thing that DNSSEC can bring about. Security, the security of your confidential information, the security of the, of the about what you're doing, all of that is part of what this can do. Innovation is another critical piece because what we're seeing is that services like Dane are letting people do things with TLS certificates, with what making a more secure communications infrastructure in ways that they couldn't before. So we're seeing a great opportunity to do this. And in confidentiality, you know, enabling the encryption of communication just this past week, we were at the Internet Engineering Task Force meeting in Honolulu. And one of the statements that came out of that meeting was a statement by the Internet Architecture Board, or IAB, that they want to see encryption become the defined method of communication for all Internet applications because of a lot of the large-scale surveillance that we've seen. They want encryption to be the new norm for communication. Dane and DNSSEC enable the kind of communication that will enable us to get to that more trusted internet. So it's one of the building blocks that we can use to go and do that. With that, I want to conclude with a couple of resources and then I'll open it to any questions. If you're interested in learning more about Dane in particular, you can go to our website, to the Deploy360 program, where we have a great number of resources related to the Dane protocol that can help you understand more about it. There's also an article in the IETF journal that explains what is going on or how Dane works and what it is. There's a document around the use cases that can help explain how it works and how it can be used. And there is a document itself. We also have a number of 
resources, again, diving into some different documents, and this is not, these are for you when you take a look at these slides, you can go out and see some of those information that's there. For yourselves, I would encourage you to come to our website and go to the Start Here page that we have, which lets you find resources about DNSSEC and Dane that are targeted for your particular type of organization or role. So if you're a network operator, if you're a content provider, if you have a website, a developer, anything else in there, you're, you can go and find the resources that are tailored for you. As Chris mentioned earlier, we are also very involved in social media channels, and you can certainly reach out to us there. We try to keep up a steady flow of news about DNSSEC and Dane and IPv6 and other technologies, and so we'd welcome you to join us there. And with that, I have a few minutes left, and I'd be delighted to take any questions that any of you may have. Thank you for your attention. Are there questions that people have? Are you going to let me off that easy? <laughs> oh, I see a question coming from the back. So it's Mia Kutani from JPNIC. Um, well, this is not actually really a question, but I just want to share some of the great works that they actually do in addition to um, this, but you know, uh, in ICANN DNS workshop. So I'm just going to switch to Japanese because I want the others to know. あの、ま、例えば実際に導入してみてどういう課題があるですとか、あとはま、そうですね、えっと、ま、それ以外にこういう計測をしてみてこんなことを確認できましたというようなあの、非常に充実したコンテンツでもうこの分野のあの第9の